So we've taken about a month's time to discuss the doctrine of grace. And we're going to come to a table where grace is displayed. And so I wanted to have some concluding thoughts about grace as we prepare our hearts to meet with the Lord. Now, we've spoken about an electing grace. We've spoken about a particular grace. We've spoken about a transforming grace. And in our discussion of grace, you may have heard of some popular phrases. For example, we don't believe in a cheap grace. That phrase gets used. That's related to the person who said a prayer or walked an aisle but no longer displays any fruits of belief or repentance. They, they will turn to you and say, listen, don't preach at me. I already did what I needed to do. And we'd say, well, has grace really impacted that person's life? And um, a lot of people think that grace is a cooperative thing, that God actually started the engine rolling, but we're maintaining it and we're holding on to it. And the book of Galatians talks about, hey, was that which started in the spirit, is that now going to be your work to complete? So it's so important that we understand the doctrines of grace and today we're going to talk about a particular phrase that gets used among the Reformed and Presbyterian, and that's this phrase called the means of grace. What are the means of grace? Well, that is a reference to a discussion about what God provides for his church to sustain us, to nourish us to cause his saints to grow in grace. So not only is there a salvation moment, moment where grace, an amazing grace transforms our heart, but there's a grace that continues on with us and bears us and sustains us so that we can sing in a song, there's nothing that can pluck us from God's hand. He has a preserving grace over our life. And so today I have two objectives and a third to wrap up is to demonstrate, first of all, that Christians actually do grow in grace. And secondly, to document God's gracious gift that he has provided for the church, what he has designed as a vehicle for grace for those who truly believe. Of course, grace will be documented in the lives of those who are true members of Christ's church, the regenerate. But related to this, uh, I'm talking about not simply a vehicle, we're going to talk about this, but about a practices that take place in the church, ordinances that take place in the church, regulations that take place in the church. What do all those words mean? That are very... Um, important for the believer because it's through these means that God communicates to his saints, to his children, that he is still saving us by grace. Now, don't be that depressed about it. This is going to be good news. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is that believers actually do grow in grace. Simple reference to some pretty familiar New Testament passages. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, very famous passage. It begins kind of dark, but it gets to where we want to go. It says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, that's quite a list, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. You used to be all of these things that God says ain't coming into my kingdom. But you used to be like that. And he says in verse 11, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And here we see in an unpacking of how a people used to be 
how God is moving them towards a new reality based on God's grace. And there's a reference to the fact that you were washed, which seems to be a reference to baptism. And you were sanctified, which means you were set apart as a unique and different people from the world, a treasured people. And then you were justified, you were declared righteous by the grace of God so that you can stand before God not guilty. Now, for those of you who really study this type of thing, and we did have a little list of the order salutis, the order of salvation, it is quite typical to see that when we describe God saving a people, that he justifies people first and then sanctifies them. And that's the way the order goes. But here we've read it differently. And it's a discussion of God taking a people out of the world from all of their practices and then through time and by his grace, washing them, setting apart, and giving them confidence in the gospel. All right? So we see the progressive work of sanctification changing in our lives. And of course, um, if you care about the uh, language of the Greek, you'll note that these are all aorist indicative um, passives, which means God's doing the work. It's a completed work as he's described you, but it is not... It is not described by time. It's an ongoing thing that God is washing, sanctifying, and justifying His people. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Many of you know this. Speaking of God giving to the church apostles and teachers and prophets and evangelists, why does God give these to the church? So that saints would be equipped. And in verse 11, 13, we read, till we all come to the unity. Which means we were all coming from different places and we're a little bit factious because we all have different ideas about God's ways of working and things we've been trained and brought up with. But unity is being uh, brought together, if that makes sense, in the church by the leadership of the church. We continue to read uh, the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. Indicated in this passage is no one here is a perfect man yet. Uh, someone who is whole or mature. Christ is God's perfect life and we're becoming over time more and more like God. Christ. Why do we have prophets and teachers and evangelists in the church? So they can train us to become more and more like Christ. God's grace is, has us on this sanctifying road of becoming more and more like Christ. The passage concludes in verse 15 by saying that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. We are growing into Christ. The goal of our salvation is to, be, is to more and more reflect the God of our salvation, Jesus Christ. And we are going to stand before God as an individual, sinners saved by grace, but that grace affords to us God's declaration of us of saying, you're completely righteous, you look just like my son, Jesus Christ. And we know that in our personal life, I know this in my personal life, my thoughts and my actions and my Daydreams are not always consistent with, I think, what Jesus would have had in his mind or in his hands. But over time, God is causing me to grow into Christ. Um, that's finally going to happen when I shed this mortal coil and nothing's keeping me back anymore, right? Colossians 1.9, the uh, Apostle Paul prays for the church that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will. And all wisdom and spiritual understanding. If you're filling something, there's something pouring in and there's a container. It's an analogy of getting more and more of something. And we're supposed to grow in our wisdom and spiritual understanding. He says in verse 10, being fruitful. And we know that fruit grows, displays itself, and becomes ripe and sweet to the taste when we finally taste it being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might. These are references to growing in grace. Um, when I was a young man, I couldn't do a lot of things because I was young. I didn't have the strength to do it. 
Now, don't get in my way, because I am powerful. Uh, in our, I know, it's just a joke. Um, in our spiritual life, sometimes we don't have the strength to conquer sin. We don't, but over time, we learn more and more to say no to sin and to bad attitudes and to practices that would be harmful to our spiritual souls. We grow over time by strength and fruitfulness. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. Again, there's a reference to your faith growing exceedingly. Love of everyone of you all abounds. 1 Peter 2, 2. We read from in our New Testament reading, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the world, not the world, <laughs> of the word that you may grow thereby. And again, 2 Peter 3.17, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's my first premise. After we're saved by God's grace, grace continues on with us, and that grace causes us to grow. It grows in ways that we measure in knowledge, strength, spiritual understanding, maturity, good works, unity, fullness, and growing up into Christ. I don't think that's very controversial at all. I think that sounds very, very scriptural. God intends for his saints to grow in grace. So the second thing I'm going to discuss is what has God graciously given to the church to ensure that we would grow in grace? What has he provided for the church that we would go grow in grace? Well, an immediate response would be like, oh, Ephesians 4. He's given to the church teachers and apostles and evangelists. And that's important because somehow we see that growth in the Christian life is connected to what's happening in a body of the church. We don't see people growing in grace out there. <laughs> there seems to be a need for communion with other believers to enhance that spiritual growth. Will reading a devotional provide that? Yeah, to some extent. Well, reading your scriptures all and memorize. Yes, that, that is important. But there seems to be something corporately important about believers being together in their growth in grace. And so we have long said, you've heard the expression, there's no Lone Ranger Christians. You're just not all high o silver doing what you want. You're working and growing with other believers because that's what the Gospels and the apostles write about. Now, a boilerplate template verse that I even heard just discussed the other day on a really cool podcast I really enjoyed was this reference to Acts chapter 2.42. Acts 2.42. Acts 2.42, which says when the church, just after Pentecost, explodes with people coming into the church, they say, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or teaching and fellowship in the breaking of the bread and in prayers. And so here we have a pretty interesting verse that right out the door, when the Christian church is meeting corporately, they find some things that automatically define what their meetings are about. They are listening to Biblical instruction. They are fellowshipping with one another. They are breaking bread with one another, which would be an analogy to what this table is right here. And, of course, this after a huge baptism event. And they are praying together. And this is where we derive the idea of this phrase, the means of grace. These are the things already practiced in the early church that were fundamental to the growth of the church. And so we first talk about proclamation. When the Bible is preached, either corporately or as we learned today, face to face, you are proclaiming the gospel. That is a, a means of God potentially calling a person to faith and obedience in Christ. When I preach, am I dispensing grace to you right now? 
No, because some people, as the book of uh, 2 Peter told us, some people becomes a stumbling block and an offense to them. But other people, it becomes a foundation stone and it's precious to them. It's the way that God has ordained for his work of grace to be manifest is by the proclamation of his word. To some people, it brings people into his kingdom. To some people, it convicts them and say, I don't want any more of that. If you're doing good preaching, you're going to get both responses. Uh, there's also a discussion of what we call the sacraments. There's the breaking of the bread. Jesus told um, his disciples, go and make disciples, baptizing them. So we see two very important commands of Jesus related to baptism and coming to the Lord's table as vehicles of appreciating God's grace. Now, is there grace in this meal? Is there grace in the waters of baptism? No, grace isn't a thing. Uh, but for those who are in the Lord, for those who understand salvation, for those who, who appreciate what Jesus Christ has done, when they see someone baptized, that's like spiritually rewarding to them. When they come to this table and they recognize all that Christ has done for their benefit, it's spiritually nourishing. And so it helps us to grow in grace. And these are gifts that God supplies to the church to help us grow in wisdom and in knowledge and in maturity and into the headship of Jesus Christ. Prayer. Is prayer grace? Well, no, but it's very hard to try to find a person who calls himself a Christian today who did it without praying. Usually we, we come to a point where we say, Dear God, save me. There was some expression of a prayer. Does the prayer save you? No, grace saves you. But the prayer just seems to be right there when we're touched by grace. All right? We don't expect people to be saved apart from a prayer, but we wouldn't say that prayer saved you. You said the right prayer. You, those words you said were the right things that got you saved. We would never say that. We would say God's grace saved you, and because he saved you, you just voiced a prayer to God that said, God, I need you. Thank you for saving me. So there's a distinction there. And, in, and then we come to the interesting notion after proclamation, the sacraments and prayer, is the idea of fellowship. I can tell you right now that fellowship is super rewarding to me. But it's not uniquely Christian. You can have fellowship at your Rotary Club. You can have fellowship at your sorority. I don't know if I call that fellowship or not. But we all have fellowship in different contexts, but does it cause us to grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ? Well, in the church, it sort of does, but we don't identify that as a means of grace, although that's an important aspect of the life of the church. So the means of grace of preaching, the sacraments, and prayer are uniquely Christian. They're directed toward Jesus Christ. They're shared with Jesus Christ. There's a communion with Christ in it, and it always tends to be corporate. We all share in them together. So again, they are not grace themselves. They don't possess grace, but they're a practice. They're a vehicle. They're an avenue that God has designed for his church to participate in. So they get an understanding of his grace not just for salvation, but for all of life and into eternity. When we come to this table, we don't only think about what Christ did on the cross. We think about where we're going to be in eternity future, fellowshipping with the Lord. And that's a gracious gift that God gives to his church. All right. I think I kind of went off script, but I'm going to get back on it here. So preaching isn't grace. But it's gracious in the life of the converted because it builds them up in the faith. It causes us to grow into Christ. Prayer isn't grace, uh, but prayer also is gracious in the life of the believer because it builds them up. It gives them faith. 
It helps them to grow in dependence and reliance upon God. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, they are not grace, but they're a sign of grace. They show us what grace looks like, that God would accept sinners at his table, that God would welcome sinners into his house, that God would take people and wash them and cleanse them and declare them to be new people. Now, I'm going to stop at this point because defending the sacraments as a means of grace is a mighty, mighty topic. It's going to, it would take longer than the time I want to right now. But we are coming to the table, so I thought fitting for us to have this in our minds. That there is something that the believers find, that the believer finds very reassuring. It's a witness to them that God is saying something to them that they belong to him. It is a covenant sign where God tells the believer, you are mine. And this is what I have done for you. So this meal and also baptism is designed to strengthen and to nourish and to cause growth in our lives. As we reflect and remember what Christ has done for us, it continually transforms us as we participate in these gifts and signs and seals of grace. Now, one thing I will say about baptism, if I proclaim the gospel faithfully, and when I champion an eternal and electing grace begun, uh, by God's eternal decrees of foreordination and predestination. Not many people go there, but I go there. I can think of no better demonstration of God's unmerited choice of his own children than by applying the sign of baptism to an infant and proclaiming, just as I have taken water and applied it to this non-consenting party, so too, this is exactly how God, by the work of his Holy Spirit, elects and sanctifies his own special people apart from any acts of righteousness that they have done. When we baptize a child, and the famous line is, what do they believe? I, what did I believe when I became a Christian? I believed everything wrong until God renewed my heart. So when we baptize the children, the children, we say God is demonstrating what election looks like. Out of his pure grace, he calls people into his kingdom, and they didn't do anything to earn it. Now, of course, there's more to this topic. But it's a demonstration of God's grace. So, uh, as we come to the table today, we want to see the gospel portrayed. We want to see our faith nourished. We want to remember the sacrifice of the atoning lamb and that we will feast on the fullness of all of Christ's promises to restore us to eternal joys. Our last objective is to look at the passage which is on the back of your order of service and to put a bow on it. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us does grace teach? Is grace a teacher? Is it a persuader? Is it a nurturer? No, it, this is kind of a personification of the idea that grace is so inclusive that it changes all of our life when we appreciate what Christ has done for us. And that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. We are living in a new day. When we come to this table, we acknowledge we're in a new day and we're longing for the day yet to come. And we look to the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. This is straight out of the Old Testament, the way that God saved Israel by special ordinances. He also saves his church by special ordinances. Those ordinances themselves aren't what do it. It's when God's grace comes to the life of those 
whom he has called. So the last verse talks about that we're supposed to speak of these things, to exhort and rebuke with all authority. And I'm taking this last part of verse 15 as my life verse. Let no one despise you. Don't you dare despise me. That's a Bible verse. And let's not despise what Jesus Christ has provided to his church to, to nourish them. I've spoken to you before about how a lot of churches in their services, they want to demonstrate an example of what the pastor has preached that week. And so sometimes you're going home with a rock or a, a broken chain link or some kind of item um, for all the well-intentioned purposes, really. It ignores what God has given us as a gift to his church. And all the things that people would want to have found memorable in a sermon really should be found here. So let us at this time remember the atoning work of Jesus Christ and that his blood gives eternal life to our souls.